All right, guys, one of the most important episodes that you'll ever listen to if you value longevity in the physical body at all. I mean, I, I feel like the industry is plagued with like anti-aging secrets for your skin and we see Botox and collagen and all these things, which are great. I mean, well, <laughs> but Botox is a topic for another day I'm not going to get into. Don't think it's great. But anyway, we're going to talk about probably a more, in my opinion, a more important element, which is longevity of the physical body. I mean, because if you can stay young physically, it's going to show everywhere. If you're still active and free and the body's moving well at 60, 70, 80, I mean, I already, unless you're sitting in the sun eight hours a day, I know how you're going to look. So super important episode. Nearly no one is doing any of the things we're talking about or not doing them well. Um, but the exciting thing is right now, elite athletes are paving the path for longevity. And why I get so excited about Tom Brady at 44 winning a bowl, Kelly Slater winning pipe at 50, or he's technically 49, week away from 50. Um, Ronaldo's still going, Messi's still going, Djokovic's still at his prime, LeBron's still at his prime. Why I talk about this a lot is they're following strategies that we can all follow Yes, there some of them you can argue are on, you know, peptides and stuff that maybe isn't within everyone's budget. But as a whole, they're training strategies we can follow, and the even more exciting part is guys like LeBron, they're playing a very physical sport and still able to do what they do. He'll be doing what he does now at 40. So if we follow similar strategies without the crash and bash on the body, because we're not playing NFL, we're not getting lined up like Tom Brady is, um, we can probably go surpass their incredible results, which is super exciting for human potential. So these guys are paving the way, inspiring a whole world to stay young physically. So a lot to cover today. I've um, got a fair, fair few show notes here that I'm gonna go through. Um, so let's talk about the physical body. Now let's talk about why the body seizes up. So if you ever hear me talk about bulletproofing the body, longevity, fixing injuries, I always talk about three main things. Stability of all major joints, mobility of all major joints and the flexibility of all the muscles, which are technically supporting muscles around those joints. So let's dig into all of them on what goes wrong. So when you have unstable joints, because no one trains them, no one's, how many of you are training ankle stabilization? How many of you guys are conscious about your ankle position when you lunge, walk, run, do anything? Unless you do a lot of yoga, the answer is probably none of us. So why is this important? I talk about the, I always talk about the foot first because you know when we move, that's the first point of contact and sends a reaction up the entire body. Or if there's an instability, it sends a domino effect of pressure on all of the joints up, up the body. So if your ankle's unstable, you, your ankles roll in generally. Um, the knees obviously are the first to cop that load, medial ligament pressure, knee issues. Then the hips overcompensate. They're often tight, weak, sore, problematic as well, inflamed. And then the lower back hits it. And then when the lower back's compensating, the shoulders are out, necks are out, the whole body is in trouble. So that's what happens, number one, is we have unstable, weak joints. And then what we do is actually damage them. So I watch a lot of guys in the gym um, squat and they'll keep trying to progressive overload their strength training and this is why we don't do one rep max ever um, because generally the muscles can take the extra load the joints can't once you damage a joint um, you can run a very good argument that, that joint will never return to 100 percent, and you'll always have that lagging injury and you can do rehab all day long it will always be a shadow of what it once was even if it's only marginal so Problem with unstable joints is it puts pressure on all the joints, which creates injuries. Um, and often, you know, I, I was chatting to one of my buddies who's a very well-known chiropractor, and he talks to a lot of people with these different cartilage issues and tendon issues. And often when we hit 30, 40, 50, the, the conversation's not, let's get you back to 100. It's like, best case, let's get you back to 90. Okay, you're never gonna get full range. Um, so we wanna avoid injuries, obviously. So stabilization of all major joints, not just the ankle, mindful movement, conscious moving. Um, obviously very difficult in a episode like this to go over, but what we're looking for generally is just level, okay? If the feet are rolling in, it's pretty obvious if the pressure is rolling in, you wanna create it level. The knees, are they level or do they go in or out and so on? So generally we just want level. If you think about structures, we want level, straight lines, okay? This is the strongest axis, okay? You don't see a, a 70 story building on an angle, okay? It's not, it's not the strongest position. So that's how we wanna think about it first. So get all the joints active, strong, stable, that will prevent the injury. Then we go to mobility of the joints, which is super important as well. 
if if your joints start seizing up, which they often do, and you know you can't get your shoulders, you know, even in line with your head, we start to get limited range of motion from poor joints, tight muscles, um, whole range of issues, excess inflammation. Um, we know we could do a whole topic on that. So we want to do start to work. And how do we think about the joints? I want you to think about every joint and what range of motion should it be able to go. The foot, obviously, main movement is flexion and extension. Often we get really tight angles because of modern footwear. So are you doing simple work, flexing and extending it with and without load? This is going to be very big for injury prevention. Um, the ankle does roll as well. So often, I mean, in yoga, I'm just sitting there stretching my hamstrings. I'll often just roll my ankle clockwise, anti-clockwise, flex, extend, and just keep that mindful connection. And then we go up the body. And you don't need to be a physiotherapist to understand how does the knee joint work? Flex, extend, forward, back. It can internally, externally rotate, and it can actually circularly rotate. So you wanna make sure you're always putting your body through these movements, obviously be careful. And you wanna be able to do load as well. And knee over toe is an example of doing a, doing that range of motion work with the load of your body or even some, some light to mid weight. Probably not gonna do a max, a max squat knee over toe. That would be maybe detrimental. Everything's got a law of diminishing returns. Doesn't matter if you're doing ice baths, saunas, three, four times a week is optimum. Seven, you start to have negative effects. Every, every product, every supplement you take has a peak, peak range. You start doing too many vitamins, there's negative effects, it becomes toxic and you, you, know, you put stress on the kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. So stability and mobility of all major joints needs to be the foundation of your workout. So most people that go step foot inside a gym don't do any of this. There's no stability of joints, there's no mobility of joints, there's maybe a little light stretch of muscle, which is like the old school way of doing it. And that is number three, you do want to have flexible muscles and you wanna do static stretches and stretching, uh, sorry, and stretches where you're moving, okay? So more movement prep for exercise. So this is the most overlooked element of nearly everyone's fitness routine. Is it sexy? Uh, I would argue it is. I would, it's, what's not sexy is being 35, bit buff, little bit overweight, can't move, can't run, can't play golf, can't do anything, always injured, nah, can't have sex well. Um, that, that's not sexy to me. So sexy to me is, is being able to move well, be fluid, feel energized, not feel tight, not feel sore every time you lift, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now we could go into the whole balance of your workout, making sure that it's got a balance of push, pull, all the range, all the um, essential movement patterns. This is gonna be an element of your training as well. We talk about that on some other videos, not so much longevity specific, but it is, everything's longevity um, if you're doing it well. So we wanna get the muscles flexible around the joints, lower back, hamstrings are normally the first to go. And most people are sitting all day long. So the biggest problems is super tight hip flexors, tight glutes, tight hips, um, muscles, joints, weak core, anterior is never on, the lower back takes all the load. So we wanna get a really, and this is where Pilates, if you know, you wanna take a lot of thinking out of it, you know, you, you do Pilates twice a week, okay? Pilates is a great complementary uh, modality. So is yoga, they're all great complementary, um, but we mix them together for obvious reasons. So they're the big three. Um, and then on that is just deep core strength and posture. If your posture is out and you're standing a lot, obviously walking, it all requires good posture alignment. I actually watched John claude Van Damme, someone interviewed him coming out of the gym, and he must be 65, I'm guessing, maybe older. He is sliced. You could just see he's hard, he's ripped, and you could just tell how well he moves. And you know what he said to the guy? He goes, worry, first thing you need to worry about, getting keeping the body straight. No one's body straight, no one's aware. Where are your shoulders? Where's the neck? Tight, keep the body tight, eliminate all the problems. Couldn't have said it better myself. So fixing the core, and this is where Pilates is gonna help a lot, build that new mind-muscle connection, get the core strong, get that back nice and straight through movement, posture fix, just through awareness, it's just training, um, keeping nice and straight, being active, turning the muscles on to support the structure, where most people, because we sit all day, our muscles are trained to be off. Our hips are off in internal rotation, which is why like exercises where we're internally rotation with pressure and squeezing a ball is great. Okay, um, so again, back to we want to work hip internal external rotation with no weight and booty bands and stuff are great because we're doing those same internal external rotation of the hips with resistance. So we're building the strength component of mobility, not just the range of motion. So yeah, deep core strength and posture. And again, it doesn't take Einstein to look in the mirror 
relax and see what your posture does. Is your neck holding forward? Are your shoulders rounded? Have you got a little hunchback in Notre Dame going? Is your core off? Are you tilting to one side? Are your knees loose? Are your feet even hitting the ground properly? Are you kind of unbalanced? So super basic stuff, guys. You do not need a PhD to figure a lot of this out yourself. Obviously, um, if you do any of our training, you'll see it. I've got a whole episode on the app on activating every major joint before you start a workout program. Um, super important. Then um, this next one I'm kind of created, I don't know if someone else has created this term or I come up with it, but who cares? I mean, we're all tapping into the universal mind. I, I don't think there's anyone's, no idea is fully original in many ways, um, but conscious movement, okay? It is the most important thing when you're lifting. Being aware when you, do, not that I do a lot of bicep curls because not that functional movement. When do we do this in life? Very rarely. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, when you're doing a bicep curl, I want you to think about what is conscious movement? Okay, conscious movement is not yoga. Conscious movement is in a bicep curl, knowing where your feet are. Are the feet rolling in? Are they active? What's the, what, are, what are the hips doing? Okay, is there an anterior tilt or a posterior tilt? Is the core on? Are the abs on or is the lower back taking all the load? Okay, this is the shoulder joint or is the posterior of the shoulder active to create a nice structure and posture? So we work our posture at the same time as we lift or is it loose and dangling and you just, every time it gets heavy, you're just hanging onto those tendons, inflaming them, stressing them out, making yourself worse and worse every time you lift. So that is what I call conscious lifting, conscious movement. Um, when you're in a push up, is the lower back taking the load and just turning off, no core activation? Are you just loading that joint? The muscle chest is not actually on. Slowing down, breathing, doing yoga, doing Pilates and then lifting. This is the magic guys, this is conscious movement. And you know who the most conscious lifter in history was? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, that's how they say he built such beautiful shape just because he had a stronger connection, body, mind, and he was able to visualize it, squeeze it, create it, it was more in the muscle than anyone um, people have ever seen in that world. So that's another thing. And with that, when we're young and we're always powerlifting and strength testing, we often, yes, the muscle works, but we overload the joint quite a lot. Okay, and as it gets heavier, um, think of a shoulder press, it's too heavy, it sits at the bottom, there's no shoulder on here. We're just loading joint in the back, and then we go up for a split second, load the joint. Muscle on, load the joint. So I call that a joint loaded based exercise. If you do that for 30 seconds, the joint is loaded more than the muscle if you measure the time. What I like to do when we change the way we lift, change the whole way the body functions, is keep the muscle loaded, not the joint. So if I'm lifting shoulder press, often I'll just go to 90 degrees so the muscle never turns off because here it turns off below 90. At 90, it's on at the top, sorry, the front and the back. And I'll go slow, or can you even go fast up? Slow down, tension on the entire time. The muscle can take 100% of the load with the joint not taking, being the, the dominant load through the whole exercise. You're gonna get better gains, better muscle tear, hypertrophy, less injuries, and this is what I call low impact lifting. Um, low impact mindful lifting is no load on the joint, load of the muscle, and being mindful of the whole body. Remember the whole body, no system works in isolation. The only time it works in isolation is in dumb machines that bodybuilders use where they're trying to isolate a muscle. This is not how you want, to, if you want to be functional, you never want to, nothing ever wants to work in isolation, ever. That is not functional. Does any athlete walking around, hiking, jumping, ever use a muscle in isolation? No. Therefore, I will never train a muscle in isolation and you know, my mentor, well, one of my mentors, Paul Check, talks about everything's got an agonist-antagonist relationship when, it's, when you're lifting on land, doing a squat on land. When you start isolating and playing with machines, you lose that, you lose the nervous system balance connect, connectivity, um, and you start playing with that agonist-antagonist balance and you put it all out. So if you wanna be longevity, get off machines, never use machines. I mean, you could, you could make an argument if you're super, a super mindful mover, you could, and you are aging and you, you, we could make the argument we, we, there is a time for machines, but I mean, I hope to never need them, use them um, in my lifetime. So that is that. You'll hear me talk a lot about the yin and yang balance. So if I had to say there's a real athlete secret to all these guys we talk about, yes, it's everything we talk about. They're all doing joint stability work. They're all doing balance. They're all doing deep core. They're doing yoga. They're stretching. They're breathing. They're rolling, okay? But what they're really doing is balancing the yin and yang. So Tom Brady in his book, TB12 Method, talks about for every one hour of impact, running, jumping, he will do an hour of what he calls uh, pliability, which is essentially yin movement. Rolling, release, massage, stretching, 
those sorts of things. So that is the formula. I've, you know, you watch uh, the other surfers talk about Kelly Slater. They're like, I've never seen anyone train less. Is he lazy? Absolutely not. He's, he's very smart. He's cultivating energy. Kelly Slater actually influenced me to get into Tao Flow because of his favorite book I read was The Tao of Health, Sex and Longevity. So he just understands to go into the yin, to cultivate energy, to create longevity. And guess what? He's 50 on tour. You know, the apple doesn't fall far from the trees. <laughs> uh, so creating that yin and yang balance, very, very simple. What is my time balance? A lot of people I speak to go, yeah, yeah, I do mobility before CrossFit, so I'm 50-50. No, that's 95-5 or 98-2, whatever it is. So as far as time goes, how long do you spend in both? And I mean, I mean, last night I was here on this floor doing yin yoga, listening to a podcast. So I'm getting my yin hours up. Um, not that that's how you should do yin, you should go into a deep meditative position, but I wanted to listen to a podcast, I did both, it was great. I really enjoyed that experience because I'm getting my yin time up to create the balance avoid the imbalance because what happens is when you're doing excess yang, it's very draining of the system. So it's said to halve your energy, it's depleting. Yin is restorative, okay? It is cultivating and it's said to double your energy. So when you create a yin yang balance, we're not workers, exercise does create a, an aging, it speeds up aging for sure. Um, excess, especially excess um, that we can't recover from. And as we get older, it's harder to recover from all those workouts because our chemicals in the body slow down, or the ones that, you know, for everything from growth hormone to anti you know, ability to fight oxidation, it all slows down. So as you get older, you, you can make a very good argument that that 50-50 balance should even go to 60-40, 60 yin, 40 yang as you get older. Everyone's biological age is different, so how that is for you will be different, but the best way to measure it is your performance, okay? If you're getting weaker, pretty, pretty clear sign, you need to rest more, unless you're doing not enough to stimulate growth, um, obviously different story. But that is the best test is if you're not getting stronger, you're not getting better, your body is in a depleted state. It might be aging or catabolic, whatever you wanna call it. So we wanna obviously rest more, recover better. So we're, you know, and anabolic or anti-aging, even though they're not really linked, but you know, for argument's sake, think of it that way. Um, other couple of things to think about with super basic stuff that we know about aging is the minute you lose cardio health or strength, your likelihood of death and illness goes 10x. I mean, really, 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 really simple stuff. So strength training, obviously, we need to continue. We're not saying don't do it. We're saying do it three times a week, high performance, measure it, track, progress. And if that progression is not there, slow down, recover more, sleep more, eat better, rest, stretch, whatever it may be. And obviously, so here's a funny one, cardio. A lot of longevity experts for the physical body, like joints would say never ever run. Um, swim, do other stuff, do low impact, rowing machine, anything off the ground. I mean, I tend to still like to run a little bit because I want to be functional, functionally strong on land. And last time I checked when we're on land, we run or walk. So for me, I would never run five days a week. I think that would be detrimental to everything I'm doing to keep my body young. However, I do run, I enjoy running, I wanna stay functional, so I wanna balance that heart rate stuff. Fortunately, I surf a lot, which gets my heart rate up through the roof, and I'm obviously floating on water with a board under me. So um, low impact on the, on the hips and knees, although you know, excess surfing can create tight shoulder problems, neck issues if you're a bit tense, and there, not, nothing's perfect. Um, in a way. So make sure you've got a good balance of strength and cardio and you're not missing cardio health. A lot of people just doing a bodybuilder split are missing out on cardiovascular health. Your heart rate is not getting high enough through lifting weights. So make sure you are incorporating a certain amount of cardiovascular health. How much? I was originally a little bit anti-hit, but there has been some good studies. Huberman talks about it. Um, if I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes for you. And he talks about going above 95% of your your, uh, your sorry, 95% of your max heart rate um, once a week has shown significant health benefits of the heart and cardiovascular system. So I do a bit of both. I'll try and do some hip, try and do some long, slow stuff. Okay, I wanna be the all-round athlete, get the best of all worlds. So incorporating that is huge. Some other things to think about as you get more advanced. Um, people like Roger Federer were quite, um, had good longevity, I guess, in their body because of the essence of the way they move, their timing, their style, their finesse, their body-mind awareness. It was very light in his movement. So that when, I, when, you, when I'm working with clients, whether you're an athlete or, or not, I'm trying to get you the essence of being lighter on your body, which is why we do a lot of animal movement, a lot of core work, contract the core to take the weight out of the body and the joints 
and build that connection with the energy, the weight. Um, even someone that does like kettlebells, you've got to have a sense of connection with weight, timing. And we want to extend that through not just moving a kettlebell, but when the body moves side to side. So they're all things to think about that are more advanced as well. Trying to mimic how these guys move is enormous. Um, but moving on to another important topic. So we've talked a lot about the physical aspects of what you want to do. So just to summarize, you want a good routine that includes stability of joints, mobility of joints through all the ranges with and without load, core strength, balance, style, technique, strength training with low impact techniques, little bit of cardio, high intensity, low intensity. Okay, there's the summary. Um, but moving on, one of the other big things we do need to think about is reducing inflammation. So inflammation is at the scene of every crime of aging, death, cancer, disease, and our lifestyle is full of it. So if you wanna speed up the way your body heals, um, gets more mobile, gets more flexible, reduce inflammation. Simplest thing in the world. Yes, I'm always taking anti-inflammatory products. If I've got to choose a smoothie, I'm choosing one with turmeric in it, and maybe CBD oil, stuff that is anti-inflammatory. However, I also understand if I'm inflaming my body, I'm eating fried food, donuts, whatever, alcohol all the time, it's a band-aid for a bullet wound. It's not gonna, it's, it's, a, it's a drop in the ocean. It's not strong enough. So what are the most highly inflammatory things? Dave Asprey talks about this a lot. He says the worst thing, and he's tested his biomarkers over many years, is he says deep fried food. So fried chips, fried anything, raises the inflammatory um, response in the body more than anything. So with that in mind, you would, he said, and I think he's even done a podcast where he says, have a donut, no, not a donut, he says, have ice cream, have chocolate, but never have deep fried food in that low grade oil, okay? And it's normally got salt and sugar and God knows what else in it. So avoiding, avoiding fried food is the main one, remove that from the diet. I mean, I, I have, unless I'm hungover and not thinking, I haven't ordered fried food for many years. Um, actually, I lie, probably, you know, in a banquet or something when I'm out, I'll probably have a little bit of fried chicken. I mean, once here and there I do find is, I don't notice anything, consistently you're in trouble. Um, sugar is oh, artificial sugar, processed sugar specifically, sugar and fruits, totally different release, totally different response in the body, not even comparable. Um, obviously dairy, white food, process, like processed white food should I say, breads, pastas, wraps, generally, unless it's gluten free and, or it's non-GMO, it's gonna cause inflammation. So GMO is what causes a lot of inflammation. So the difference between organic oats and non-organic oats from my research is worlds apart. You wanna try and go for that low glyphosate um, in, in the mix, in that fertilization process, and you're gonna lower the amount of inflammation that that uh, product creates in the body. So removing inflammation is huge. Anti-inflammatory um, substances where you can is gonna be huge. And then the obvious one, which everyone's talking about with longevity, the most important ele element of longevity is sleep, rest, sunlight, the basic things that a lot of people miss. So you need to set up a good sleep schedule. Um, if, you're, if a person that for whatever reason is only getting five, six hour sleeps, you need to get a cat nap in during the day. You need to find 15 minutes, try meditation during the day. You've got to compensate. You've got to make up for that loss because um, nothing will kill you faster than poor sleep. Stress, lack of sleep, no, matter, no, no, matter, no, no amount of ice barred saunas is going to make up for a poor sleep, sleep routine. And that's what I see everyone doing. Everyone undersleeps and then does more time in ice barred saunas, ca caffeinated substances, taking, I don't know, steroids, whatever it may be, TRT, just sleep, <laughs> get your sleep right, and all that 10 X's, or maybe not 10 X's, but it, it, it improves. So getting a good sleep routine, you can track the quality of your sleep as well. I was really lucky, I mean, wearing my whoop, I was terrible, I was still on my phone before bed, which they say you should not do, and I was sleeping like a baby. I'm having really good sleep, so mouth taping, these sort of things, measure it with a whoop or aura, it'll tell you, you know, you don't wanna be, I don't wanna be stuck measuring my sleep every night forever because you kind of get a bit in your head, it gets a bit unenjoyable, I wanna just feel. Um, but other things to really help is if you're finding it hard to sleep, do no yang activities before bed, no dopamine highs. So no, no WhatsApp, no TikTok, no Instagram, no scrolling, multiple things. Um, I don't even like podcasts anymore. It's just too much noise, talking, clutter. I've had enough clutter all day. Declutter the mind the hour before bed. Slow breathing, slow down. Change the ambience of the mood, the lighting. Very dim, maybe a candle, maybe some nice smells. 
Obviously no caffeine late in the day, stuff that's gonna calm you, cool you, have a stretch. I often will have a nice stretch routine before bed, just calming down. Reading a book can be okay, but some would argue um, it's still a little bit too busy mind. Um, but don't have too many rules either. If, if something's working for you, I mean, <laughs> what, what, what do they say? Don't fix what ain't broken. Great strategy for life. Um, some other things that um, science is really catching up on is grounding and sunlight. There is a magic to being feet in the earth, skin in the sun, um, feet in water if, if possible as well, especially outdoors in nature. This has an anti-inflammatory effect, anti-oxidating effect, calming, soothing, negative ions. Um, there's a lot of science backing up how good this is for just healing, healing injuries, healing soreness, flushing inflammation. It is phenomenal. So getting outdoors um, is huge. And you could also say eating live food. Don't get into the trap of eating low carb bars, low carb wraps, gluten free this. I mean, cardboard is gluten free and you know low sugar as well. Um, the healing power of chi and prana um, that comes from the electromagnetic field of the universe. We get it through good water, natural fruit that's alive, live, it's live in chi, and we get it from our breath and the earth. So you wanna make sure you are living holistically as well, getting that energy that heals chi, this prana that they've known about for thousands of years, um, that we get through, as I said, the food, the grounding, earth, breath, proper breathing, slow, full breathing. Um, all these strategies are gonna help you live longer because they're cultivating energy within the body. There's an intelligence to this chi that will heal the body. Where if you're living in a sky rise on your phone, no, no natural sunlight, no grounding, think of that New York <laughs> trading guy that's on too much coke, caffeine, alcohol. You know, it's, that's, not a, that's the opposite of longevity. Um, it's a recipe for heart attack, stroke, breakdown, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I mean, if you're in a time in your life, you want to go do that and you're feeling it, I mean, go nuts as well. See how, see how it goes. And for God's sake, try and uh, get out of New York for once a month and, and regenerate, go into the yin. But um, I think that's a good overview of creating longevity. I mean, this is what the elite athletes are doing. You may obvious, I haven't talked about all the obvious stuff, cryo, ice, sauna, peptides, growth hormone, um, stem cells. These are more technical things that we, we can do a whole episode on, um, but these are really just mastering the basics and more movement focused and basics for everyone. A lot of, uh, the reason I don't talk a lot about the peptides and stuff is master the basics first. It's like I had a, a buddy of mine the other day, he's like, oh, should I, uh, should I have, um, what's more absorbable, uh, fish or chicken protein? I need to decide which one to do. I was like, dude, you live on bread rolls and don't train. That, that is not in your first hundred problems. <laughs> you know, master the first hundred most important things and then I'll answer that question. And, and it might've sounded like I'm being a dick, but it wasn't. It was, it was kind of creating this like, uh, hopefully this rhetorical kind of aha, question of why, why are you worried about, <laughs> why are you not mastering the 100 basic things? So mastery lies in the basics, sleep, rest, yin, movement as we're meant to, and think about how we evolved. They're saying we evolved to step about 22,000 steps a day for a male, I think it's a little bit less for a female, maybe 14, 15. Um, you're gonna get a lot leaner, it is great for the heart, great for the mind, get outdoors, do it in bare feet if you can, breathe well, drink it, you're killing multiple birds, with one stone. So try and avoid, like right now I'm in Bali and I realized um, my steps were super low because you scoot it everywhere, it's so hot. So I had to really make an adjustment because I did notice, I noticed my, I was holding a little bit more fat. I, I, without science, I did feel a little bit more clogged up. The movement that comes with walking, it has a magical effect, I think on the lymphatic system, the heart, the blood, everything. There's, there's an, there is a power to walking, but it's not enough. So try and walk. Force yourself to walk those few blocks instead of cabot or drive. Go to the gym that's an extra mile away, who knows? Because um, these things, little things do make a big difference. So master those basics and stay tuned. We'll do some more advanced episodes um, in coming weeks.